Great, thank you for the welcome and thank you, Natalie, for the introduction. Does that sound about right to people? Uh, up a little? Yeah. I'll try to stand a little closer. Um, uh, I am really pleased to be part of this uh, uh, lecture series uh, I read here in 2007, I think. So it's been quite a few years and I uh, uh, think this one on Wild Waters of the West is uh, really intriguing. But as uh, Natalie said, my presentation is going to be a little bit different. It, it's not a lecture. I'm going to be reading an essay from Montana Surround. And when Natalie asked me to do this, uh, after she had read it, um, I wasn't sure how it f would fit in. But the more I've thought about it, I think it will, particularly since, completely unplanned, the occasion of this essay is 16 years ago, just about this week. 16 years ago on February 10th, 1996, was in the midst of Missoula had had, uh, and this is all by just a little background, uh, uh, at least a week, maybe more like 10 days where the, temp the high temperature for the day did not get above zero. So everything was frozen up big time, and the rivers particularly. And then we had a sudden thaw, and uh, so there was flooding and ice jams. And uh, one thing that happened was on February 10th of that year, a UM student, uh, Ryan Cross, uh, was down by the footbridge, the pedestrian bridge, and Jacob's Island, and out on some ice, and he, uh, the ice broke, and he disappeared. And uh, he's, his body was never recovered, never has been. So that's the, the kind of the backdrop that week. And I wrote the essay after actually several different nights uh, walking, uh, but a couple things that happened one particular night, walking down there. 
And so I'll be interested to see if we uh, have time for questions, how you think a, this is a different kind of communication, uh, a personal essay, and how you think it may fit in in our larger environmental dialogue that involves a lot of need for uh, scientific approaches and uh, legal approaches, political approaches. This is a much more personal and storytelling approach. Uh, I think that's plenty to say. Uh, I'll just read a little. I, I was Googling on it um, on this period, ice jam of 1996 from Montana rivers. During the winter of 96, a massive glacier-like ice jam ominously descended the Blackfoot Rivers Canyon. Passing Milltown, it threatened to break the dam. So th th I'm, I did want to mention that other context. Although my essay isn't about that backdrop, the Milltown Dam was still in place 10 miles upstream from Missoula. And this event, the narrow escape we all had from this ice uh, that they were worried about, the big jam coming down the Blackfoot, taking out the dam, which it easily could have, they had to draw it down to prevent that. But it also created, it scoured the toxic sediments and created a, at least a 50% fish kill downstream. Uh, that event was kind of the tipping point in the uh, realization by everybody that uh, the Milltown Dam was dangerous and needed to go. Uh, and, and of course, in this interim, it's been removed. So a lot of things have changed and some things have stayed the same. That's plenty of talking about what I'm going to do. Now I'll do what I'm going to do. Jacob's Island. The February air was damp and chilly, a midnight in midwinter that felt more like April. When I stepped out my back door, the yard was a mix of sog and snow, half-thawed footprints and icy puddles, and the world at ground level was a working lesson in hydraulics. Water was everywhere, pooling, trickling, eroding ridges of ice and mounds of snow. A few days earlier, two feet of snow hardened to white glass by weeks of sub-zero temperatures had looked permanent and arctic. Now, most of it was gone. On my late night walks, I usually left by the alley, but this night it was impassable. Knee-high mounds of crusted slush, treacherous sheets of ice compressed by tires and polished by sunlight. I went around to the front of the house instead. The sidewalks ran an inch deep in water, dark, shallow canals running between the snow and ice drifts. Half a moon hung above the Missoula Valley. I stopped and stood still, staring up at it. It took a long minute, my mind in mid-step, before I understood what I needed. The river. I wanted to follow all that water wherever it went. Water's story is one of the very oldest, and it sounds simple, although I don't think it is. Seek your own level. I needed to be close to the river to feel I could even try. Bare branches arched over the street between our house and the University of Montana campus four blocks away. Above the branches, the gray bulk of Mount Sentinel loomed like a ghost of cloud. Half a mile east, the mountain was beneath me at the same time that it towered over everything around me. I could have walked on it, and I often do, but this night I wanted to stay in the valley. I was on my way to the river, and it was only my luck that one was so near, and I had my choice of routes to it. I walked on up the sidewalk, searching out the shallow spots. On both sides of the street, spreading maples line old-fashioned parkways, and well-kept houses and yards were set off with mountain ash, weeping birch, blue spruce. I've never, I had never lived anywhere quite like it. The woman I love and had married a few summers before had lived there 20 years. The house and the yard, if not the trees, were hers, and she shared them with me fully and easily. It's the kind of gift I have trouble accepting, that place more of my luck. So often I feel like an imposter. Though if someone, say a stranger, had walked right up to me out of nowhere that night and spoken. If a stranger had appeared suddenly and asked me without warning the question we all ask ourselves, where's your home? I trust I would have stood my ground, both feet planted. I trust I would have said, here, right here. Like many, like so many of us though, I could be the wrong person to ask. While I'd, I've been in Missoula over two decades now, 
All told, I've lived in 10 states and a province, 14 cities or towns, and three country places, at least 40 apartments and houses, all of them rented but two, and one of those, this house on McLeod Street. The last place I'd lived before I came to Missoula in the Clark Fork River was near the Niangua River in the Missouri Ozarks. And in my private myths, those rivers flow into each other. For nearly nine years, I lived on a bluff above the Niangua, growing food and planting trees and picturing myself there for the rest of my life the way a tree planter will. But something in my picture was missing or wrong. I wasn't sure what or which, but I went with my instinct. With not a whole lot more understanding or much less urgency than a river cutting a new channel, I left a handmade home and marriage to come to Montana. I was 39 and I thought I wanted to be alone, at least in my home. I could no longer think of anything I wanted to do except write and hike. And on every map I looked at, Missoula was ringed with mountains, a small town in the middle of the Rockies with a live river at its center. How could I go wrong? Once onto the university campus that night, I picked my way through snow and mud. Beneath an inch of surface melt, the frozen ground was still hard as brick. 20, 30, 40 feet below, in the flumes and gravel corridors of Missoula's aquifer, groundwater drifted southwest in perpetual darkness. It's where our wells go. It's the darkness from which we drink. I turned north in the middle of the oval, following a row of tall pines planted by a graduating class 60 years before. From three blocks away, I thought I could hear the flooding river. Minutes later, I crossed a small concrete bridge onto Jacobs Island Park, a few acres of old river bar, sediment, and rock piled up as the river slows out of Hellgate Canyon. The island was stabilized in the 1920s when sugar beet farmers started ditching from the river here. Half a mile downstream, the Corps of Engineers filled the river's north channel and gouged the south, taming the river to protect the city from floods in the 1950s. This night, though, it was still the wild Clark Fork, falling 100 miles from the Continental Divide below Butte, its waters swollen along the way by both the big and little Blackfoot. Just over the canal, I stopped short and stared at backhoe tracks that stretched out, out ahead of me. The mud there had been matted and mangled in a cold, dirty wake, and it was then that I remembered the story. I, I thought it was then I remembered the story I'd seen in the newspaper. Search and rescue teams had been dragging the river. A sophomore had made a mistake on the ice. This winter, nothing near the Clark Fork was tame. Crews had blasted, fire-hosed, shoveled, and dived into ice and water, searching for his body, and the evidence of their efforts was all around me. The canal bed lay tortured. The backhoe had dredged up piles of broken ice plates and stacked them on the banks. Water washed through mounds of muddy gravel slush. The body was still missing. I looked downriver. The, pa the papers said the student, Ryan Cross, had grown up in eastern Washington. Beyond Missoula, the Clark Fork twists and pulls in that direction, through the Bitterroot Mountains, the Cabinets, and the Purcells. So many fits and starts, stops and pulls, stops and spills against soft flesh and hard bone. Such a cold, wild way to go home. I was nearly seven when I moved to the first home I can clearly recall except in dreams. And before it, my memories of place bleed all together with little hint or keen of a natural world, few forms of life different from myself, no weather much beyond the calms and storms of family. In the family storm that brought me there, my father had disappeared into another binge, and my mother had two teeth rotting and two kids under 10, one of whom, my sister, my grandfather was raising. On a hot afternoon they sat, my mother, my mother and her father in his 1950s Buick outside a small rental house on the edge of Omaha, Nebraska. I waited in the house, watching through the dark veil of a screen door as our future was negotiated. That future took shape with the help of my great aunt Hazel, 
who rented a large ramshackle house in South Omaha, Hazel, who taught piano and worked in the yard six days a week and directed choir and played in the yard on the seventh, took us in. Despite the deaths of her two husbands and her hand-to-mouth dollar, dollar a piano lesson household economy, her life and much of the life I remember there with her seemed an exuberant mix of two musics. One, a child's chorus of scales, practice book songs, Methodist hymns, and half-mastered classical exercises that drifted from the open windows of her house. And then the other, that five cents full body music of the yard itself, a triple lot surrounded by sycamores, elms, box elders, and divided into wandering paths by lilacs, roses, and peonies. There were always rough piles of grass, leaves, and branches, all the hidden cor corners and crannies where a kid like me could find dead birds and old bones, live bugs, rabbits, snakes, squirrels. Today, though, I could search forever and not find a trace of that house or yard. When you cross the Missouri River from Iowa into South Omaha on I-80, you come to the 24th Street Interchange in two miles. Over the years, I've driven those concrete loops from all directions, searching for scant evidence of a place and a past that now hangs in thin air, at least 30 feet above the freeway traffic. 2416 Lamont. It's the first address I can remember. I turned away from the ruined canal bank, not wanting to think too long about Ryan's lost life and missing body. I stepped back off the bridge and followed a footpath upstream. Jacob's Island is shaped like an arrowhead, its downstream base cut off sharply by a concrete chute that funnels much of the canal flow back into the Clark Fork. At that end, the bridge end, the island is more than 100 paces wide, a rolling field of mowed grass and pine. Upstream, as the island narrows, the groom of the park disappears into a few acres of ragged cottonwoods and washed up logs. As I headed into those woods, water echoed loudly on both sides of me. I took a few dozen steps into the shadowy trees and pulled up at a rush of wide water that flooded my trail. He had drowned near dawn. His companion said he stepped out on the canal ice in ankle deep water. Imagine the rush of that cold danger. But there were several layers of ice, several rivers rushing between the layers. Depth after depth, Ryan disappeared among them. It was colder there in the trees and all at once much darker. I felt suddenly lost. I fell back on a trick I taught myself in childhood whenever I felt lost. I stood still and closed my eyes. Ten thousand years ago, fish schooled hundreds of feet above where I stood that night. Half of Washington State was shaped by the weight of the water they swam in. Dozens of faint shorelines traced these mountainsides, mark, marking each rise and fall of glacial Lake Missoula. Dozens of generations of natives rose and fell here too, Salish, Kootenai, Blackfeet, Nez Perce, the shadows of other names most of us can neither pronounce nor understand. Meriwether Lewis forded Rattlesnake Creek across the river from Jacobs Island on July 4th, 1806, and he logged the place in his journal, quote, the river enters the mountains where the hills set in near on either side. Today, a plaque in a concrete pylon commemorates his crossing. It stands four feet from traffic on Broadway Street next to an exit lane from a McDonald's drive through have to check if that's still there. I, it was a little plaque right by McDonald's. Meriwether's Ford, Ryan's Death Place, backdrop for another golden arch. This island, this valley, this place where the river enters the mountains, whose home is it? Whose home has it been? Only five miles up Rattlesnake Creek, 60,000 acres of designated wilderness sprawl north. Many of the mountain lakes there were made or modified by settlers working water claims for the town below, where 
In 1917, the Chamber of Commerce assured home seekers that they would find, quote, more and better lawns in Missoula than in any Montana city, unquote. More than 90 years later, this place, my place too now, centers intense struggles between diverse versions of the past and visions for the future. People buy land, build houses, and expect a role in the play of the place. Pay your money and pick your story. Newspaper letters voice the resentments between natives and newcomers, a local variation on a global drama. I'm in my 50s. Well, I'll leave it there. I'm in my 50s, and nearly six people live for each two here when I was born. If you tack on the zeros one at a time, the story gets too simple. The stage shrinks, the cast grows. Yet there is much more alive here than just people. Jacob's Island pointing straight into the canyon that French trappers afraid of ambush called the door of hell lies directly in the midst of the largest wilderness areas in the contiguous states. Habitat for millions of trees, shrubs, grasses, fish, birds, mammals. More than a few people in these valleys work hard to construct stories for the animals and plants in the mountains who can't or won't speak their own. Of course, commerce tells its stories too. Cyanide leach gold mines proposed and reproposed beside the rivers, oil and gas leases threatening and re-threatening land sacred to the Native American nations. The multinational Plum Creek Timber Company providing jobs, products, and portfolios to a modern world owns or leases more than a million acres within a half day's drive. Tons of heavy metal tailings, detritus from the Butte mines whose copper wired North America still drifted down the Clark Fork, settling behind the old Milltown Dam a dozen miles upstream. At the same time, three Indian nations, the Salish, Kootenai, and Ponderay, survive on the far side of the Rattlesnake Mountains. They safeguard the Mission Mountain Wilderness, and their home includes, at least nominally, half of the largest freshwater lake west of Lake Superior. Yet on their reservation, Whites outnumber Indians five to one. The tribes struggle to preserve their original languages and their sacred places, some space in the story. Yet the question returns, which story? A lake bed, a swamp, a wilderness, a paradise? And whose story? A trading post, a city, an ecosystem, the last best river running through the last best it? We live in a place and search its stories for the home we find in them. We rush to catch up to the past. Back in the ragged woods of Jacob's Island, the silty stream at my feet hadn't stopped moving and hadn't gone anywhere. I wasn't sure how long I'd been staring at it, but I was beginning to believe I might be able to jump it. I remembered the drowned man again. I turned back. I took a few steps down a side trail toward the river and leaned against a broad old cottonwood that grew straight but askew, angling toward the top of the mountain beyond the river. I pressed back into the tree and felt the heft and resilience of the trunk, like a huge spine I could have for a moment, as if the me it dwarfed was only the heart of something much stronger and taller that leaned out into the night. Thin clouds diffused the moonlight. I took off my gloves and huffed in my hands, watching the shift and blink of the sky. What was most real I couldn't see and didn't need to. Water in a hard, slow fall all around me, an urgent mix and royal, a wild music like nothing else in the world. I spent four seasons exploring Hazel's yard before my father returned. That next summer, he recorded my mother sitting with her on Hazel's wooden porch swing while I fished for fireflies with a mason jar, my childhood version of catch and release, hoping whatever happened when adults held hands and kissed would happen again between them. And it did. In October, my parents rode the train to Chicago for a weekend of second honeymoon, and then the three of us moved to a duplex a few miles from Hazel's house. It was only a half a block from Hanscom Park, 60 acres of hills and old trees with a two-acre lagoon, and I began to roam there every day after school. 
I was content in the crisp solitude of the park in fall and yet able to see our back door if I only craned my neck. Inside our duplex, despite the calendar, it seemed like spring. My parents' divorce wasn't spoken of. There was talk of bringing my sister home. That didn't happen though. In the real spring, six months later, my father hit a gravel truck in his fair lane. The VA gave us a folded flag for the closet, along with monthly veterans benefits, without which we would have had to move back in with Hazel. With them, and with my mother's payroll clerk salary, we could certainly have moved elsewhere, but we didn't. For the next few years, after school and on weekends, and especially through the long, clockless summers, I lived in the kind of delirious grace that children let loose out of doors can sometimes inhabit. I found it at the lagoon and in the hills and ravines and trees of the park and in all the places I called my hideouts, my forts or sanctuaries. Like most kids, I had no one in particular to hide from and nothing much to defend or protect, but I remember crawling under bushes and peering out for hours on summer afternoons, often falling asleep. Sure, I was secret and safe, feeling without the words for it, chosen and welcome and just plain lucky to have found such a place. It was many years before the park ever began to feel small, and at least a decade before it dawned on me that it was anything less than wild. <clears throat> the stranger on Jacob's Island appeared in the darkness like a blue-collar ghost. He stumbled up the trail from the river, zipping his pants. I pushed myself upright and stood away from the big cottonwood. When he saw me, he jumped back, startled. I raised my hand straight up, palm open, a gesture I didn't recognize as my own. Evening, I said. What's happening? He asked. He was tall and thin and younger than I. He wore an old hooded knee-length raincoat to his knees and scuffed high heel logger boots. I felt out of place in my Christmas Gore-Tex parka and two-year-old Basque hikers. Just watching the river, I said. She's sure been high, he said. And even more than before, I saw the signs of the recent flood everywhere, streamers of debris, stranded nests of twig and wood. There's still a four-mile ice jam up the Blackfoot they say could break free almost any time, I said. I'm just hitching through, he said. I don't know where that is. He stretched his arm and pointed in the direction of I-90. It laced the valley a half mile north of the river. Up river a little ways, I said. Let's just hope it don't get at us, he said, grinning. So, would you take a coffee, he asked. I have some fire. Now I grinned. We stood in wet boots on the low end of an island that had been flooded over within the last few days after midnight. Fire, I said, like where? My place. He motioned toward the brush behind him. Plasticville, USA. He smiled and then laughed, but he stepped up too close to me as he spoke. I'm heading back, I said. Where's back? Here, in town. I gestured toward campus and then wished I'd pointed the other way. I felt a twinge of fear of the night, of the river, of this stranger. Well, it was real good to meet you then. He winked at me, almost as if my fear showed right through as clear as a limp or a lisp. He stuck his hand out. I'm Ronnie Tender, he said, from Tacoma, Washington, and points around. I shook his hand. Jacob, I said. Jacob Bryan. I lied too quickly to wonder why. You shouldn't stay this close to the river tonight, though. She'll wake me up if she rises, he said. No, I said, a student drowned right over there last week. I pointed toward the flooded canal. This river's dangerous right now, really. They're warning people away. Well, I'm dangerous too, he said. We'll just have to tough it out and see who's worst. There's a place downtown where you could sleep, I said. I'm not homeless, he raised his jaw and squinted at me. And anyhow, tonight I've got this whole wet little wilderness right here. He waved his hand toward the soaked bushes. Tell you what I don't have though, Jake. What's that? Scratch for toast before I hit the ramp in the morning. I reached for my wallet. There were four dollars in it, and another time I'd have offered him one, but I held them all out. He took only two. 
He thanked me, or Jacob, and we shook hands again, and then he turned and left. I walked back down the island and crossed the muddy canal again. On the way back through town, I thought of Ronnie near the river and his island shelter for a night, wet wood and a plastic sheet. And I thought of Ryan, lost in the wild, cold water, somewhere between here and the place he grew up. Home. It's where the heart is and the hat hangs. We do our homework and home in and then stretch and steal until we're home free. Bread and bound, coming and cooking and called. Home buddies and boys, makers and wreckers. We're brave and it's broken but sweet. We run away from where we can't go again. Buried in print fine enough, home can even be the grave, while the Greek kamai, to lie down, descends through Norse, Latin, and Middle English, leaving its trace a most basic sense, dwelling, the place where one lies. Hazel's yard on Lamont Street saved me somehow. Her yard and then the water and trees of Hanscom Park saved me, I think. All that and my mother, certainly, who surely must have often longed to move from the house that recalled her newly remarried hope and loss. But I believe she stayed on there because her son had found what she called home away from home, a real neighborhood complete with vacant lots, tall trees, half wild hedges, and all of it centered and rooted in the park so near and childhood vast. I can remember so clearly everything I left there. People first, faces, hands, voices, but always far below the surface, insistent as the hidden creep of an aquifer or the cold silence of a river under ice. Deep beneath my memory, there is always Hanscom's calm lagoon and no one else in sight. Those were the places where I learned weather, a child's urban wilderness. And no matter how thoroughly altered the landscape may have been, there was limitless sky above me, hard dark ground beneath me, trees of every size to give a scale and pace to the wind-driven march of mid-continent seasons, and clear water to reflect any mood or daydream I offered. Absent these, I would see nothing as I do. The next morning, I drank coffee and stared through the kitchen window. Gray clouds billowed in the west, threatening more rain. I went out and walked back down to Jacob's Island. A few blocks from home, I read the headlines through the window of a vending machine. The search for Ryan Cross had been officially called off. A sidebar in the paper even raised the question that his disappearance might be some kind of hoax. I glanced at the photo of the bereaved father standing at the water's edge. His face didn't look like a hoax. Before I turned east along the river trail, I scrambled down a slippery bank. Large chunks of ice floated and tumbled in the river, offering a different face to the sky each time they rose. They reminded me of my fortune-telling ball, handed down from a cousin well before I moved to Hazel's house. A heavy glass sphere flattened on both ends and wrapped in gold-colored foil. The glass opened on a murky maroon interior as if it were filled with thick oil and cherry coke. You'd ask a question and shake it, and one of 12 stock answers would rise to the top, suddenly readable and portentous. Will I get a bike for Christmas? Only time can tell. Will we move again soon? It's written in the stars. Will I be as tall as Dad? The signs are unclear. Sometimes I would question that glass ball late into the night. Where do all the birds go at night? Your friend knows. <laughs> if Mom and Dad and me died, what would happen to the rest of everything? Please ask another time. I've always assumed that the poet Yeats was speaking of death when he said that, quote, all life is preparation for an event that never occurs. Now I'm coming to believe that home is a longing for somewhere that never was and a myth that maps a place that may never be. Is it the longing itself in which I dwell? Perhaps so, and perhaps there's nothing wrong with that. 
Yet I hope sometimes to allow my longing to float free and separate of my places, if only that I may fully inhabit either, and if only for a moment at a time. In such moments, I sense a truth beneath all desire, a water, wood, rock truth, a flesh, fur, feather truth. It's a wordless world that shifts and evolves, even as our longings haunt it with the power of both the past and the future, the dead and the unborn, even as all our myths about it code our desires into the endlessly recurring narratives of progress or preservation, escape or change. Surely it's clear by now how much of our history traces the bloody struggle between our different longings and our separate stories. And when those conflicts cause real suffering in humans, other animals, plants, and the land itself, I wonder, will we ever be able to cre create another story together? Will we always be separated into the homed and multi-homed and homeless? Must we measure out the world, dividing it neatly into wilderness and home? I know these aren't questions that any one person answers alone, and certainly not I. The myth of longing in which I live and which, from which I speak should be pretty distinct by now, as identifiable as a lisp or a limp. Yet I don't believe I'm alone in my trouble. It's a difficulty many of us share, I think, walking in the world, talking to each other. I climbed back up the bank and hiked a half mile downstream and crossed onto Jacobs Island again. In daylight, the dugout icebound pool where Ryan Cross had disappeared looked even more ragged than it had in the dark. The university clock tower chimed nine times in the distance. I gazed off into the mix of mountain and sky that receded east toward the divide and the other two-thirds of Montana, the other two-thirds of the nation. This was the same way I had first come to Missoula years before, driving I-90 through a heavy summer rain with everything I owned in my old pickup. Through my windshield, the wet green wilderness of western Montana had looked beautiful, vast, indifferent, and a little dangerous. I exited the freeway a few blocks from Jacobs Island, right across from the same ramp where I hoped Ronnie Tender had been lucky that morning. Thring things strangers have in common. I knew no one in this valley either. I knew no names. Pretty close here. Jacobs Island Park was dedicated in 1976 and named for a generous family who owned a local bank. Aliases of the Clark Fork include the Arrowstone, Bitterroot, and Pend Oreille, and the origin of Missoula's name are no less various. One from the Salish, Amisa Latiku, the place where one is surprised or taken with fear by water, is not unlike the feeling mythologized in the French origins of Hellgate, the fright of ambush, ambush in Boscus, the fear of being in the woods, Yet since whenever the last lake drained, the landscape does change abruptly right here, from open valley to narrow canyon, from one arc of blue sky above to big sky all around. Humans and other animals alike may have come to where the mountains sit close to the river and felt a heartbeat alertness, a sea change at the edge of a missing lake. A year after his disappearance, someone planted a memorial cottonwood tree and placed a small plaque by the river for Ryan Cross, who has never resurfaced, dead or alive. Although the plaque is only a simple marker with a name and a date, to me it commemorates the confusions of ice and water one winter along the flooding Clark Fork, the surprise and fear one man may have felt as he vanished. My father is buried on a hillside that overlooks a busy intersection in Omaha. It's a place with no water, but whenever I stand there, I feel an alertness as quick and deep as fear. The dates aren't mine, and though I can see that ground in my mind at will, neither is the place. Yet whether on the hillside or in imagination, it's always my name I read there. In my story, the names happen to be identical. But even if they weren't, even in the stories where they're not, the name in stone always belongs to whoever reads it. 
The body lost in the river is always our own. Out on the brushy end of Jacob's Island, I retraced my steps from the night before. I jumped two small streams, followed the path up river as far as I could, and climbed up on a waist-high boulder to watch the morning river and sky rush by. When I began to get cold and made my way back down the island, I couldn't keep myself from looking for Ronnie's camp, and in the morning light, it wasn't hard to find. I saw where he had curled and slept under bare branches, the mud and wet leaves pressed hollow. And I did find the black remains of a small fire on top of two flat stones. I didn't see any wood around that looked like it had ever been dry, and it occurred to me how handy someone like Ronnie would be on a pack trip. I scrunched down and sat cross-legged. I held my hands over imaginary flames. A small dark beetle emerged from under a cracked leaf near the edge of the blackened firestones. It struggled out onto the leaf and under and out again, falling on its back, its legs flailing. It was the only living, unrooted thing I could see. Much quicker than language, vague yearnings flickered inside me. I'd like to hold the beetle. I'd like to talk to it. I'd like to squeeze it until it speaks. And if it won't, I'll squeeze it until it dies. I want to be the beetle. I want to eat it, to hollow it out and wear it around my neck. I would bury it in a matchbox. I would tell it, I'm sorry. I would say, I was only kidding. Flashes from my weird mind, or boy mind, or human mind. I didn't know which. I just kept staring at the beetle and the leaf until I wasn't sure which one was moving. A thin mist of rain began to fall, pattering on my jacket and my head. I knew I'd wimp out in another minute or so. I always do, but I held off as long as I could. Wind rattled the trees. The beetle dug down to wherever it had come from. I was wide awake, but I felt asleep. Asleep and hidden at the same time, I sensed there was nothing in my life or the world to hide from. It was just one moment at the center of a life, like always. It was only one small island in a wild, swift river. I bent back from the waist and lay down in the weather. The rain on my face was light and steady then, and in it I felt Ryan and Ronnie and the beetle and me as surely as the natives who had walked this ground and the fish who swam above it, all our ancestors, everyone's, as well as those whose ancestors will become. There were many raindrops. For one moment, we were all at home in the wilderness. Thank you. Oh, that was longer than I thought it would be. Yeah, okay. So, yeah. Comments, questions? question is how do I feel myself looking back uh, on something I'd written a long time ago and something that happened even longer ago than that. Well, it's kind of, it's, it's curious. I hadn't read uh, until I talked to Natalie about this series. I hadn't reread that essay, oh, I can't think of, several years. Um, and so it's curious. It takes me back. Uh, but of course, it's also distant too. But I'm glad that I preserved it because that that was an, something important, I hope I conveyed it, something important was going on for me and my relationship with this place and with this river and, and uh, understanding where I come from and what I, you know, this whole search for home. So now reading it, I, I'm really glad that I did that and I can, I still think about those same things. It's not certainly as if I answered them for myself or anyone else. Uh, for all time. I'm still confused about what home is and where my home is and why some people don't have homes and, 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 and what's the difference between wildness and home and all that. But I preserve something for me for, in, in the writing of this that I'm glad. And, and it, it feels kind of eerie too to, to read it. 
I guess that's one of the better words for it. Helen? Did you buy it for a specific magazine or for your project work? Or? No, I'll tell you the honest truth. I was in the process uh, of completing, you know, I'm a, most of you probably know this, at least graduate-wise, I'm a U Montana product. I came up here in 87 to uh, attend the creative writing program, and I did my MFA, and then in the mid-90s, I also uh, went through the environmental studies program and did the MS environmental writing, which is what I now teach. Uh, so I was in that process of working on essays for that that be later became my thesis, and then the thesis became the book. And I should mention, too, because uh, she was asking about uh, what I was working on or how that came to be. Uh, it first appeared before my book was published. It first appeared in this anthology that the Clark Fork Coalition put out, which is so faint. This is a Russell Chatham cover. It's beautiful if you can look at it close, but uh, it's faint. Uh, the River We Carry With Us that was all about the Clark Fork. And this ties into the issue that the essay isn't exactly about, but uh, because they put this out in 2002 as part of their, uh, the Clark Fork Coalition was one of the lead groups in the the at least five year or longer process to remove the Milltown Dam. Uh, many other people and groups were involved, but Clark Fork Coalition was definitely involved. And so they put out an anthology of all kinds of stories and essays about the whole reaches of the Clark Fork from, from uh, Silver Bow all the way to the Idaho border. But a lot of them are in this center reach. And that's where it first appeared. And I probably rewrote it a little bit to go into the book, I always fiddle with things a little. So, uh, and then just another coincidence, uh, for about six years after that, I was on the board of directors of the Clark Fork Co Coalition during that period when we were working to, uh, with a lot of other people to get the dam removed. So, you talk a lot about the character of the Clark Fork in that uh, short story, and those <coughs> One of the Milton Town Band in place, and you just said you had a lot of experience with the Clark Fork being on coalition. Do you think the character of the river has changed, even though it's seen kind of like time in the memorial? Yeah, I don't know. The river's character is so, uh, yeah, so much larger in some ways to me. Any river is the character could be is so much larger and bigger and deeper than we anything we can do to it. On the other hand, <laughs> we've dammed almost every major river in the western United States, so we changed the character, at least temporarily. And I can't say is right around Missoula it's changed necessarily, but certainly it's in the, a, a, a fascinating process of change up at the confluence of the Blackfoot and the uh, right where the, because for years you drive by there and it was a, a I don't know how big it was, maybe a 100-acre reservoir out there where the, underneath, at the bottom of that was where the, historically the Blackfoot and Clark Fork came together. Uh, and so that's, that's still very raw and rough after 100 years of being under millions of cubic yards of sediment, but it's changing uh, and it's, it's fascinating too. But that's a good question. I don't know. I guess this gets to that question of permanence and impermanence and our efforts. You know, a lot of the people, Abby and others, have all said, well, we've did, done all this damming, but, it, you know, given enough time, they're all going to fill up and they're all going to break and they're all going to be gone. But that doesn't, that doesn't address what we might want to do with them now. Yeah. Somebody out here? Yes, sir. I understood what you said when you said that this was a personal memory of the day. And I appreciate that. Thank you. As a creative writer, what do you say, what do you hope that a reader makes a little bit of that? The question was, as a since this is a personal narrative based in a lot, I mean, you learned a lot about me uh, in my past, whether you wanted to or not. Uh, and the question is, as a creative writer, then, when you do that, what are you hoping 
and maybe working toward in your revision process. And I'm glad you asked that. I have some students from a class we just met today and we were talking uh, a class writing nature and environmental essays. We were talking about the balance between writing about something that rises out of yourself and, and yet somehow getting readers to trigger their own memories and associations so that it doesn't seem self-centered and uh, but somehow pulls readers in. And I guess that, that's certainly right along the lines of what I would hope. Uh, now this audience, I have read this essay years ago out of town, and so people didn't have the associations, a lot of you do, that have been down there. Oh, we haven't mentioned another big change. This was before Bark Park. So Jacob's Island is different in that regard too. But you have associations with the place that other readers might not. But I'm hoping even with the personal things, we all have a sense of family. We all have a sense of, on one level, what this is is what Terry Tempest Williams, part of what this essay is, falls squarely into what Terry Tempest Williams calls uh, environmental autobiography, uh, which she and other people, you know, somewhere in the process, writers write about how did they come to have their current care for or whatever their relation is to the environment. Where did that start? People are interested in that on a whole lot of levels. Environmental educators are very interested in it because we'd like to be able to promote that kind of awareness. But of course, there's no formula for it or that kind of concern or affection that I was trying to talk about with me came right out of the middle of the city uh, in a couple yards and, and definitely in a city park. But somehow, it. Uh, Although I've had a lot of different and probably wilder experiences as an adult, uh, something about the genesis of my my relationship to the larger, you know, the, whatever whatever we call it, the beyond human world, nature, the world that was here before we were uh, began in that place. So I'm hoping that triggers everyone's associations of, for, you know, how how. Well, in their past, what place was it that, that set them off and uh, that they still maybe go back to in their minds? Of course, I don't know whether I've achieved that or not, but. Any other? Ah, I can always count on it. Yeah. Well, this isn't so much a question, but I'd like to say that uh, I haven't heard or read that for quite a few years. But it really brought up for me memories of the, the energy here in Missoula during that point, when the ice was starting to break up. It went all the way up the Blackfoot for miles. And when it started to move, it took out homes. So speaking of homeless home, who has a home, it actually took out several homes along the way. The how of that ice moving. And it brought up a lot of things anxiousness about the uh, heavy metals behind the dam and what might happen if the ice came, if it broke the dam. There was a lot of concern sure. about that. And then the, the uh, mystique and mystery of Ryan slipping away under the ice. It was just really powerful winter here. And, uh, and I think that uh, it's neat to have that written down in this piece. Some sense of that uh, uh, mystery of that particular winter in Missoula. I mean, it's, we had a little evidence of it just a couple weeks ago when we had that, um, you know, really heavy duty snow. You know, our house, 17 inches in 48 hours. I mean, we had that sense of the weather really coming on and really, uh, it, and it didn't last too long. But uh, yeah, those, and so that's part of what I'm trying to get at too. We all live our little human lives, my little human life with my mom and dad and where I come from. But we're living it on this, embedded in this much larger and more complex pattern of events of, you know, both living and non-living, you know, the weather and the landscape. And somehow we play it out. And I, and I think maybe not so much here in Missoula, maybe not so much here at UM, certainly not so much in the environmental studies program, but I think we, it's very easy to forget that larger embeddedness and those larger stories that always, I feel like, influence our stories that are going on. 
sits with me. I mean, like really appeals to me or really what in my relationship with nature, what do I like the best or what really speaks to me? I don't know. Water is certainly one of them. I mean, I think that's pretty common, the power of water and moving water, and but still water too in, in lakes and stuff. Um, I, I don't know. I think it changes from day to day. Uh, the flight of swallows, you know, make, you know, if, if I'm not too distracted with my daily life, it can, they can almost just make me want to drop to my knees just to watch, you know, the patterns, that, but I often forget to really pay attention. But there's a million things, and I, I imagine we all have them too, and sometimes they're tied up with that danger, I think, and that's maybe part of why I was writing about this kind of a night and this kind of a place, uh, that there's danger involved too, that it's, they're stronger than we are, except for Ronnie. Tender. He had it. Off. He had it covered. But, uh. I noticed that you don't live in a particular house, and that these we talk about your parents and them getting back together again. Was there a sense of a home in that paper property? Boone um, says that the home is for your soul. Was there a place that felt like home there in that sixty acres? In the sixty-acre park. That's curious. Yeah, it's interesting. I don't really mention much about the, the buildings themselves. And I think for me that, that's partly because my childhood life was a little, uh, you know, like a lot of us, the family, I, as I alluded to, was the family was broken and uh, my father was a veteran of World War II and he was pretty well broken. And uh, so I think I, I was lucky to kind of get my sense of home. Uh, certainly I had it with the love of my mother, but something about in that park, uh, something about freedom at that park, and just that age from about 7 to 11, 7 to 12, uh, I think, because I don't think of it as in this duplex we rented, uh, and even at Hazel's house, which, again, like I said, it's, because it, it was a huge interchange that they, when they built I-80, and so as best I can calculate, the, the whole street would have been about 20, 30 feet up from ground level now, so it's absent. Uh, as a lot of, you know, we see that kind of change all the time. But I don't think of the home or the soul place as being in her house that much either. I love that her music her, would come out the windows. I remember that a lot while I'd be playing in the yard. She'd be teaching her lessons or having her recitals and, and that, that music would drift out into the yard where I was uh, getting muddy. <laughs> Great. Thank, Thank you. you all so much.